Welcome to the Cross Board Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Stouffville, Ontario Mayor Ian Lovett. But before we jump into that interview with the mayor, I'd like to just say thank you. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds lights on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, we are lucky to have some amazing backers, including Jeff from Nova Scotia, who just recently made an annual uh, donation to our show and purchased a subscription, which you can do, conveniently linked on crossborderinterviews.ca, our website. Every contribution to the show, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the content that you've come to expect, whether it be through the cross-border interviews main uh, show or municipal affairs with Chris Brown, or even the political trenches, local government work. We have everything municipal covered for you. So with that, on to the show. Mayor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start uh, the line of questions off with the question I ask have asked every single person who's ever appeared on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Ian? Great question. Um, you know, it's funny. I had absolutely no political aspirations uh, really ever. Uh, in my life, I wanted to be a... a an English teacher. Uh, life took a little turn uh, to the West when I ended up in British Columbia, ended up being a pastor actually for about a decade and moved back to Ontario from BC uh, to work with a youth development organization called Muskoka Woods. Um, spent 16 years working with them and youth development was my focus and uh, marketing and business development. And my wife and I were coming back um, one of the perks of working with Muskoka Woods is we actually lived in Muskoka for the summer. And so we were on our way home uh, as the uh, 2020, 2010 election. And I thought that one of the councillors in our town was going to be acclaimed. And I said to my wife, that is wrong. Like no one should be acclaimed. There should be at least somebody that's running against them uh, to make them earn it. You know, they, they've got to get out there and knock on doors and, and earn the vote. And so I looked at my wife and I said, what do you think, honey? Like, can I, can I do this? And she was fully supportive. And I had uh, very quickly, you know, it was close to the deadline, filed the paperwork, paid my sign fee deposit and had the ugliest signs, you know, the worst signs ever made and, and known to man uh, created and I ran in the election. And through that process, I fell more in love with our community, uh, knocking on doors, talking to people, um, hearing what their concerns were, what they liked, didn't like about the town. And um, I actually came second. There were two other guys that uh, ended up running against the incumbent. And I came in second by a pretty narrow margin. So I was actually really quite happy with the result. And at that moment, uh, the election night, when the results came in in 2010, I said, I'm absolutely running in 2014. And so I ran for a seat, the same seat that I ran in 2010. Um, the incumbent had was running for mayor. So he vacated the seat. Um, I was um, blessed enough to win uh, that election in 2014 and sat on council for a term. And then uh, over the 2014 to 2018 term, we had a pretty tumultuous term of council with uh, the mayor who uh, was elected and felt like I could do a lot better and the town deserved a lot better. And so I wanted to put my hat in the ring and run for mayor in 2018. And I was successful in doing that. And then I ran again for re-election in 2022. So it was really like kind of an unorthodox journey to get to um, you know, to the mayor's seat, but I really just fell so in love, more in love. I mean, we've been in Stouffville since 2006 and, um, it was just probably one of the most incredible experiences. And I love the, I love elections. I love talking to people. I love knocking on doors and meeting people on their turf. 
um, you know, and, and dealing with issues and, and listening. And that's the biggest thing I think that any politician would say is that if we're not good listeners, then we're probably not very good at our job. So that's how I got into this whole thing. So it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like you were a green candidate. You didn't really understand politics. You kind of just didn't want the person to be acclaimed, which I'm in full agreement. No one should ever be acclaimed in any office. I just think it's bad for democracy. Did you understand the jurisdictional roles when you decided that this person who's running for uh, the local councillor in my area is going to be acclaimed. I, I, I'm i going to throw my hat in the ring because I think it should be contested and heck with it. If it's federal, provincial or municipal, I don't care. I just think it should be a, a, a contested election. Like I can imagine that if it was a provincial election and there was no one contesting the incumbent, would you have said the same thing? Or was there something about the municipal allure that drew you to it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it, it's our hometown, right? It's our yeah. community. And um, there were a few decisions that had kind of been made by uh, our local government that I, you know, that impacted me as a, as a dad and as, and as a parent, my young kids at the time. So there was a decision to remove the toboggan hill in Memorial park, which just kind of happened. It felt like overnight, there was a decision to remove the outdoor pool uh, because it had reached its end of life cycle. And there was not a lot of capital to, you know, um, put into restoring it. And some of these decisions that were impacting my friends and our kids, um, I thought, you know what, um, you know, if we're not planning for these future asset management, needs and we're just going to arbitrarily take out a toboggan hill uh because the director at the time said it was the right thing to happen um that kind of woke me up a little bit and, and you know but but honestly truly you're you're correct chris i was totally green kind of going into it i mean i'd been to some council meetings but um certainly didn't know anything about procedural bylaws at the time <laughs> didn't know um really the theater that takes place uh, within a council meeting um, for better or for worse. And, um, and I just went for it. And, 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 th and then that 2010 to 2014 term where I didn't win, I got very involved. I started attending council meetings weekly. I started, um, you know, working with community groups to try and influence some decisions of council and, um, the rest is history. <laughs> One of the things that I try to do on this show is try to explain the levels of jurisdiction and try to figure out, is there an apathy when it comes to municipal governance in this country? And I think there is. I And I, I say this with respect to all levels, of, uh, to the, all municipal councillors or mayors who come on the show. Municipal politics isn't as sexy as federal and provincial politics and federal and provincial mm -hmm. politics. Do you find that there's an apathy even within your community when it comes to what the jurisdictional roles the municipal government has and is uh, purview to uh, deal with compared to other levels of government? Or do you see an unknown in this country? No, I think that there's definitely a disparity um, in understanding certainly about what the different roles are. I think you're you're bang on. I mean, being an MP is way sexier than being a counselor. Um, but here's where I think people need to be educated. It's actually the municipal level of government that is closest to the people and actually has the, the ability to impact, uh, you know, you as a resident and solve a problem that you might have or um, address planning issues in your neighborhood, um, make decisions that you know directly impact your your bottom line like your tax dollars where you know with at a provincial and federal level you know they don't they they just pass budgets right i mean and, and change the and change the tax levies you know i mean and what we're assessed and so I, in my mind people need to understand that probably the most important vote you can make is at the municipal level because it impacts you so dramatically more than the provincial and federal level. 
does it weigh on you as a local representative, particularly as mayor, because you were there to lead the uh, the council, but you're also part of York Region as well as, uh, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. There, D- does it does it make you a better politician to be able to say the decisions I'm making at the local level right here right now are going to impact my family, my neighbors, my friends the day after I make them, because the day you make a decision, the day after they're implemented. So is it hard to sometimes make decisions that are so impactful on people's day-to-day lives at a local level? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, how do you deal with it then? How do you deal with it? You have to take a step back. And, you know, like I've said this countless times, the residents that kind of corner me about, decisions on taxes. Um, that's an example. I'm a taxpayer too. <laughs> I'm not exempt. I don't get Don't a, say know, that. Like, Come on. A, Mayors don't pay taxes. What are you talking about? I don't I'm get joking for anyone who's listening. <laughs> um, you know, it's and it's important though to make that to make that this that that clarification because I'm making those decisions for myself as well and they impact me and my family. And so sometimes and it's really difficult so i'll give you a give you a great example for a number of years prior to my involvement in politics the town was not putting away an an ample enough money into capital reserves and uh, the province in 2018 i want to say it was uh, mandated that municipalities have an asset management plan that they followed and fulfilled well that's prudent and, and and I think a very good strategy that all, all municipalities should be following and now it's legislated, we have to. But when I got into office and, and as a counselor, we started looking around going, there, there's no reserves. Like we don't have nearly as much as we need for the for the amount of uh, assets that are reaching their their life their lifespan. And it's getting every year we, it goes on, it gets more expensive to put a pipe in the ground. So we started um, just a, we just started adding 3% to the tax levy that went straight to capital reserves. And that's a really tough, you know, um, that's a tough decision because if your operating tax levy is, you know, 2.5, well, when you add the 3%, you're at five and a half now. And you know, that's, but that's the right decision to make. If we just keep punting it down the road for the next council, there's going to be 20% tax increases and there's going to be assessments levied against all everyone in the municipality, because we need to replace the giant pipe on main street or whatever, whatever that might be. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult in making these decisions because even though it's the right decision to make, they do impact everybody, including myself and including all of council. And we and we we wear that burden, I think, um, very seriously. You know, we don't just the, the, the taxpayer is not a blank check, you know, and so we have to find the efficiencies. We have to demonstrate that we're doing the hard work of looking as where where we can find efficiencies within the budget. What you know, what are we? underspending on that we can shrink those budgets to find some efficiencies there. What we have, what can we punt down the road? Um, you know, and so another example of that was uh, in, so our budgets are historically have been in January when we're doing them. And uh, we had a municipal comprehensive review uh, done in January of 2020 and, you know, leading up into COVID, right? And so we have this presentation done about where we need to be on a pay scale. So we're competitive because we're a smaller municipality. We were losing people to some of the larger municipalities in the region who are paying more for doing the same job. And we want to be competitive as we can. And we feel like we've got a better value proposition in terms of work-life balance and what we offer. But that, that MCR, if implemented, would have been an 8% increase on the tax levy. Well, we deferred it until the budget time, which in 2020, I think we started in January, but the the budget meeting was beginning of March and COVID was just starting to be a thing. And we literally, we said, you know what, we're gonna put this on hold 
uh, much to staff's chagrin. <laughs> uh, we put this on. We put this on hold because we wanted to see where things were going to play out with with COVID. Well, then you know, little did we know that in by the summertime, people were, were losing their jobs and people were being laid off and workforces were all at home and you know people were being you know um, laid well, they're being laid off, right? And so that's the worst time to implement you know, a municipal comprehensive review or compensation review, I'm sorry, for our staff. So we have to take these decisions in tension with what's happening in the time and place that we're living in and how it's going to impact our community. I couldn't look at my neighbor next door who lost his job and say, yeah, I just gave our CAO, you know, a 6% raise. You, you've been in public office for about nine years now. You're going on your 10th year next year. Um, you you have probably had to make some tough choices, and there's there's many people out there who are making tough choices across this country in your position as mayor and councillor, and then you have to go sell it to your community, and that's probably the hardest job of a municipal politician is selling the decisions you make to make people understand that it's for the betterment of the community. How important is it for you as the mayor of your community, even as when you were a councillor, to communicate with not just the people in your echo chamber, but to everyone, the people who didn't vote for you, the people who don't follow you on Facebook? Because I I find in the provincial and federal realms, that's what is happening right now. And I'm hoping that doesn't go into the municipal realm. And please tell me it's not in your community, because I'm hoping that there is no echo chambers and it's just the echo chamber of your community of Stouffville. Yeah. Yeah. You make a great point. Um, I never want to be accused of not communicating to the community. And that happened when I was on council, I started a, you know, a word blog that I, you know, was updating about decisions that were being made. And, you know, there was a few hundred people at the time that, you know, were following it. We started having town hall meetings on a, a biannual basis in the ward. And those things have continued and actually only increased. And so now there's the mayor's monthly that I have in the newspaper where I'm talking about, you know, a, a topic of, uh, of that's important at that moment. Um, you know, I've got a website uh, that I'm updating constantly, newsletter that goes out um, every month, um, you know, very active on social media which is, you know, a broad reach of people. I don't know if they're all from Stouffville or not, but. In well, I can matter. tell you, I follow you on social media and I'm not from Stouffville. I'm from halfway okay. across the country. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're you know, that, that's a great tool to broadcast. Um, but we're also doing um, community meetings that are very topical. And so there's an area within Stouffville called Musselman's Lake. And it's uh, this beautiful Kettle Lake that we have in town. Um, in the 1940s, it used to be cottage country to Toronto and in the 70s, it started to become, you know, transitioning to permanent residence. There's traffic issues around the lake. Um, we had a public meeting for the residents about to hear their concerns about the traffic issues. 100 people showed up, which was a great turnout. Uh, I, I was very happy with that. Last night, we had a meeting on the health of the lake. Because it's a kettle lake, there's not a, a an inflow and outflow that um, is you know regulating the constant turnover of, of water, and so there's some there's some complexities to living on a kettle lake and how you can help uh, protect the lake. So we had that last night. Again, there was like 80 people that showed up last night, and we partnered with our local conservation authority who brought in a, a lake doctor who talked lake science and blew everybody's mind um but doing those types of events um more often i think is actually key getting out into the community i think as politicians often we we can fall into um a slumber i'll say of uh you know people need to come to us right you, you want to talk about something come to council um you want to you know, you want to have a meeting, you come to me. Like, I, I, I want to posture myself as, as being as accessible as I possibly can. My, you know, my cell number is available to anybody. I will answer your phone call uh, if you call. And if you leave a message, I'll call you back. I mean, 
we need to, as politicians, be, if we're representing the people, we need to be accessible to the people. So I am certainly, you know, I, I get a biannual newsletter from my MP, you know, that kind of tells me what she's been doing, a lot of which I've been at already because <laughs> I get invited <laughs> to these things. But it's kind of a highlight reel of what happened in the last six months, right? And it's like, I'm not, you know, disparaging our, our MP in any way, but in terms of communication to the community as a resident, that's not enough, you know? Um, I think that we need to do a way better job. And certainly uh, I, I think it's a lot easier at a local level. We have a lot more direct rules and contact, um, but the upper levels, I think need to do a better job. The role of council and municipal government has changed a lot over the last decades. And I think it was only exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic for you, when you first got elected in 20, uh, 2014 to now, 2023, what's been the biggest change you've seen at the municipal level that has uh, sort of taken you back and said, when I started, I did not expect that I'd be dealing with X, Y, and Z right now because other levels of government aren't doing it or it's just now fallen upon the municipalities to pick up the football and run with it? Yeah. So... Uh, a couple things. One one thing that the pandemic did, I think, across the world, is it forced everybody to um, to fast forward plans uh, when it comes to technology. So we were one of the first municipalities in Ontario to uh, amend our procedural bylaw to allow online meetings, as an example. So. That was something that at our CAO at the, at the time came, you know, sat down with me and said, look, we have to do this. We're going to be out of the office. We need to keep municipal government happening. And this is what we're going to do. And we're like, yep, yeah, let's do it. So there's just practical things like that. I think that um, I never, like in 2014, I tried to pass a motion to, we were doing audio streaming only. And I tried to pass a motion to do video, you know, add the video component to it. And it, you know, it, fell flat on its face and died. And no, no one on council was interested in being on video. Well, COVID comes along and we have to. And now we're live streaming, video live streaming our meetings, which to me is a far more open, accountable and transparent way to hold our meetings for people who can't come into council chambers. Um, are the issues so you're dealing are the issues you're dealing with the same as what you were dealing with in 2014? Uh, we're going to talk about the issues of Stouffville in a few seconds here, but I just want yeah. to know, like, w was there a big change in what you were dealing with in 2014 to what you're dealing with now? And yes, everything happens, finances, housing, and that's a big topic of discussion right now. But are there even health issues that you're dealing with that you didn't think you'd be dealing with, or education issues? Yeah. Because that those lines of jurisdictions that people don't really understand are coming more apparent when I'm hearing from counselors and mayors like yourself, where residents are coming up and saying, I have an education issue. You're my mayor. I want you to address it. Yeah. So uh, I think the bigger one uh, for us, and I would, I would say it's probably the same across the board in, in the province and the country is the issues around mental health and certainly the impact in our kids. Um, it, there's probably not a week that goes by where I don't get a request for some support. Um, and a lot of times parents are, they don't even know what they're asking for. You know, they just want, they just want, they're struggling. And especially coming out of the pandemic, um, I've got lots of friends who are teachers in the York region school board and the, and the Catholic school board who are, really struggling because the way things kind of were pre-COVID to what they're dealing with now, um, you know, you've got kids that are entering grade eight that are at like a grade three level, you know, and um, there's some big social challenges that we're facing. Now, that's not obviously a local responsibility, but it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're still getting the calls. We're still getting the requests for help. Um, you know, and, I, and that's not to, you know, put the blame on the, the, the board of education or the education system. 
for the ministry. It's it's just a reality. You know, and you, there, you can't nobody. pass the buck, can you? You can't pass the no. buck and say it's not my jurisdiction because you're the one that they've come to. Yeah, that's right. And so any requests that I get from a school, um, you know, to, to try and support what they're doing and their and their vision, especially in a post-COVID uh context, I, I'm hundred percent there. You know, I, I will do anything that our, we have more one high school town. If I get a call from our principal, you know, I'm there for, her. you know, like we just need to, we just need to be that type of community. And if, if, if maybe one of the unintended positive consequences of the COVID, you know, experience we all had is that which now forcing us all to come back together. We were so isolated for so long and now, um, you know, we're, we're neighbors asking neighbors for help again. And when you live in a bedroom community like Stoville, it's very easy just to drive into your driveway and go into your house and not talk to anybody. But now we're seeing more and more people are reaching out for, for help and, and we're needing to respond to those situations as a municipality. Your job as mayor is, and I, I, I apologize for saying it this way, but I have to. Your job as mayor is not a full time job, but it comes with a full job, full time responsibility job. So you are mayor twenty four seven, seven days a week, three hundred sixty five days a year in your community. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You don't go off to Toronto to do your job. You make a decision, and you are in your grocery store the next day. Have you found the balance of being mayor? and just being Ian acceptable and achievable in a small town like Stouffville? Uh, You know, it's funny because the first term when I was uh, elected, my wife and I actually were talking about this this past weekend. Um, for, the, for the first time, I felt like I could walk around town and no one knew who I was. So um, that anonymity is gone. <laughs> <laughs> in the second term of council and um you know uh, <laughs> a really kind of a funny story my wife and i we we walk in the morning you know really early and uh sometimes you see nobody and sometimes you see some people and uh we were walking last week and there was this lady coming towards us and you know my wife's always very polite and saying hello to everybody and um this lady had just this scowl on her face and uh she the like I died a thousand deaths by her eyes. <laughs> I knew she was not a big supporter. And, you know, we laughed. I was like, did you see that? You know? And anyway, you know, that's just a funny example that that anonymity is lost. And, um, but I, I do, I also do believe in a work-life balance, you know, and I have to take steps to ensure that Ian is, healthy and exercising and spending time with my wife and my kids. And um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it is challenging though at times uh, to your point. I mean, it is 24, seven, 365, you know, and, but, but I, I also signed up for that. Like, that's not a big surprise, you know, it's like you get elected and then, Hey, you know, you didn't know this. No, um, and, and I, I understand that sentiment, but I, I, I want to, and I, 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 I've never asked this question, and I apologize if it comes out of left field here, Ian, but I think I, I want to. Your family, while they signed up for it, they signed up for you to go away and do your job as mayor or counselor. When you they go to the grocery store with you, you may be 20, 40 minutes to go run in and grab a carton of milk, and they're waiting while dad or my husband is talking about the land use bylaw that was just passed at the budget. So is it, yeah. is it, is there times when you have to say to residents, I, I, I would love to chat with you. Here's my business card. I I'm with my family right now. I'm just going to go deal with them because they're my important part right now. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you, Chris. I haven't had a lot of those experiences, Really, you know? <laughs> yeah. Honest, honestly, people have been very respectful of, of time. Um, you know, we, we, we've unfortunately had to make a decision not to uh, eat out in <laughs> Stovall often in the evenings because um, that did start to happen quite a bit. Uh, but, you know, if I'm at a lunch meeting in town, absolutely people will come by and, you know, will say hello and 
um, they won't interrupt the meeting, but they will certainly introduce themselves. But in the grocery store, no, that, that I can count on one hand in nine years the number of times that that's happened. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I want to turn to my second segment because I'm cautious of time here and then I want to make sure that you get out in the time that you need. Um, I want to talk about the challenges and the issues that are facing Stouffville right now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. I seem to get very strong emails written to me whenever I ask this question. Don't know why, but here we are in 2023. Ian, in your opinion, as of recording this, sorry, your uh, mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what is the biggest issue facing Stouffville today? Man. Or issues. And yeah, uh, there's a few. I think um, so managing growth is a huge one for us. Uh, the unintended consequences of that growth on our asset management plan and infrastructure planning is is huge and uh also the complexities of our geographic region in the town where 95 percent of our municipality is protected by the green belt and the oak ridges moraine so we have been um a sleeping dog for a long time and in i would say 2006 when york region brought the big sewer trunk up ninth line from markham um you know, people started discovering Stouffville. Um, I grew up in Markham as a kid and would come up to Stouffville to see some friends. And, you know, it was this little tiny farming town. Not anymore. Like we're 50,000 people now. We've doubled twice since 2006 and we're going to double again in the next 25 years. Uh, but we have a very finite area where we can do that. So we're not going to see the, the sprawl um, through our municipality because like I mentioned, we're protected by the Oak Ridge Marine and the Greenville plan. Um, but that poses some challenges too, because all of our, the majority of our tax base, 90% of our tax base is residential. And so we don't have the, the key balance of commercial and industrial taxes that make it uh, a lot of these investments into our capital infrastructure or uh, investments into leisure or um, you know libraries, with just our capital, it, it's a lot harder for us to make, to stretch a dollar. And certainly with some of the decisions that the province has made with Bill 23 as an example, kind of clawing back some of the development charges, um, that's made it challenging too. I mean, we still don't know what the full implication of that is because we haven't received a definition of affordability yet from the province. So we don't know what that affordability number is because if you build an affordable house under the province's definition, you're exempt from development charges. So there's a lot of things that are happening and, and that are out of our control, but you know, we, we all listen, I mean, sure you've talked to lots of people about the housing crisis that we're all experiencing. Like that is, that, that is, we, we can't just bury our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. So we have to do our part. And we're willing participants with the province to ensure that we're contributing to their housing pledge of a million and a half homes in the next decade. What's your cut? What's Stouffville's cut of that 1.5 million? Is it like 10,000, 5,000? 6,500 is the number that has been assigned to Stouffville of the 1.5 million. So interestingly enough, for the timing of this uh, recording, tomorrow is our council meeting where we're gonna be making that pledge uh, but we have over almost 11,000 units in our pipeline in the next decade. of, And those aren't just pre-cons. Like those are investments where developers have bought land, have paid money for studies, um, you know, are getting their, their draft plans submitted. Like that's a very real, uh, a, like 6,500 is very, very possible for us. So um, that's really exciting. Um, is What's the population but, in Stouffville now? 50,000 people. 50? Roughly. 50, five zero. Oh, 50. Okay. So that's about another 5% or just over 10% increase there. Um, you talk about the infrastructure. That's 6,500. That, that's 6,500 units. Oh. That's 6,500 oh. units. Right? So that's <laughs> going to be, you know, 
<laughs> Sorry. 15,000 okay. people. Yeah. So yeah. you talk about the infrastructure deficit that you have. You talk about the growth and the asset management. You talk about uh, where this money is going to be coming from. And you know, and I know that municipalities don't just have an unlimited supply of money that's coming down the pipe. How do you balance growth with the realities that municipalities like Stouffville is under right now? So we have to phase it in, um, you know, and this is something because we're part of we're a lower tier municipality and York Region is our upper tier municipality and York, yeah. York Region is responsible for the infrastructure for growth across the region. It's a very delicate balancing act uh, between allocation of what's available in our water and wastewater system today versus where that's going to be in 10 years. And so uh, at a regional level, we're having these exact same conversations, but only region-wide. Um, York, York Region by 2051 is going to add another million people. And so we're going to double in size at 50,000 by 2051. York Region is adding a million. And so the investment that's required for the infrastructure to support that growth is astronomical. It's in the billions. And so we need to take you know, strategic baby steps, I'll call them, towards that goal. You know, we're, we're delivering roughly 750 homes a year right now. Um, a lot of our growth that we're seeing because we are constrained geographically by the moraine and the green belt is vertical. And so, you know, a one acre site that would have been maybe four or five homes on it is now 300 because there's a condo going there. So we've had to really change the way we think about our growth and we are in our official plan that's still in draft form we're hoping to pass it later this year um, is really focused on the missing middle you know 85 percent of the built form in Stovall is single family home and we need everything in between you know between a single family down to a laneway suite like we gotta really focus in on the missing middle which i know is a bit of a buzzword right now but it's actually true for us because we're so heavy on single family homes. Uh, is, is, we often talk about all three levels of government need to come together to uh, fix uh, address the housing issue, which is completely understandable. The feds, the province, and municipalities all need to get together and work on this issue. But we're, we always forget about the last one. We always forget that there has to be buy-in from the community because the community has to sort of adapt to these new changes that are going to be uh, thrust upon them, whether that be growing up or growing out. Either way, municipalities need to sort of work with community members. We are seeing the rise of a lot of nimbyism right now in this country. And I say mm -hmm. our country. Are you seeing that in Stouffville or are people wanting to see uh, an array of different housing varieties in your community to help those who are trying to get off their out of their mom and dad's basement and into their own first apartment or first house. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely there is nimbyism everywhere, including in Stovall. But I think that um, to our staff's credit, we're doing a really good job through our OP review process to educate the community. Uh, you know, I like to say that, you know, the, the first goal of a, of a leader is to define reality. And, uh, and that's one of the things that I think we've done a very good job of as a municipality is defining our reality and what our constraints are and what outside forces there are that are putting pressure on us, like the province, right? Um, you know, the, the, the growth plan for the province in 2018 dictated that we are gonna to grow to 100,000 people. And so we get that number and we're looking at each other in a room and going, where are we gonna put them all? <laughs> you know, knowing the constraints, like it's easy for a city like Markham because they've got so much greenfield development land available. Um, they don't have the same constraints that we do with, you know, provincial policy on the green belt and the moraine. So which is good. We're not going to see the sprawl that, you know, you're going to see across the GTA and across the 407, but we've got a really unique opportunity to create something really special here, knowing that we've got, you know, all this green space and we're going to have the density of a small city really by the time that we're done and all the benefits that, that come with that. So 
it's exciting to try and manage through that. Um, but at the end of the day, every four years, um, I have a job interview if I choose to take it. And, um, you know, if, if people don't like the job that I'm doing, um, they're well, they're, they're, they're very welcome to vote me out. Uh, I, I'm not a career politician, you know, uh, I'm in this because I'm passionate about our community and I think I'm doing a good job, uh, in leading us through some of these challenging times that we're experiencing. But if I'm not supposed to do this job, I don't want to do it. So if there's somebody better that's coming in behind me, um, I will be their biggest supporter and biggest cheerleader if they get voted in and, and I happen to lose to the election. Can you clarify something for me here for two seconds? I, I appreciate your answer there, but is it the municipality of Stouffville or is it the municipality of Whitchurch, Stouffville? It is Whitchurch, Stouffville. Okay, so, so legally, am I getting this yeah. wrong? Because like I've been mentioning Stouffville the entire time, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've been addressing the municipality that I've been talking about for the last hour wrong. <laughs> so it is Whitchurch, uh, Stouffville, right? <laughs> it, it is, but we went through last term, we went through a rebranding exercise uh, because uh, if you talk to somebody who lives here, they will say they live in, in Stouffville. Um, if you live in the Whitchurch area so quick history lesson which church was a municipality uh lots of farmers with lots of money stoville the community was a municipality didn't have any money <laughs> the <laughs> province brought us together uh so the farmers saved the the community of stoville and which church stoville was formed in 1970. okay with the influx of people in our community they never say they live in which church stoville they always say they live in Stowell. So we went through a rebranding exercise, um, created a new logo, some brand values, some aspirations in the last term of the council. So for intense, all intents and purposes, we're Stowell. Thank you for that clarification because it helps me ask this <laughs> last question here. Um, so I am a big proponent of tourism. I'm a big proponent of municipal tourism. I think municipalities have a big part to play in bringing Canadians to our own backyard. I just had the pleasure of traveling across this country from Calgary all the way through York region, all the way through Clarington, all the way to Quebec and all the way back. And I visited some great communities. My uh, list of places to stop next year is Whitchurch, Stouffville. So <laughs> for those who are going through the York region and are up in the Oak Ridges Marine, what are some of the hidden gems in Stouffville and Whitchurch Stouffville that they should be stopping in and seeing? Great question. So we are very fortunate to be on the doorstep of the Rouge National Urban Park. And so uh, Parks Canada, the newest park, is uh, literally at our border. And we have a trail system that comes up from the Rouge into our downtown area and the historic downtown area of Stouffville. Um, and we have a, a vision and a plan to extend our trail system actually right up to the wineries that we have in town. And so we have two award-winning wineries, international award-winning wineries actually, um, in our community that uh, as we kind of extend the trails, you'll be able to literally walk from Lake Ontario right up into Stouffville and go to our wineries and, and try some of, uh, try some of their wine. Um, we, we haven't confirmed this yet, but I'm pretty sure that we are the golf capital of Canada. I think that we have the most golf courses in a municipality. Uh, I've got our economic development team looking into this to see if we can actually put a flag in the ground and declare that. Um, but we have about 40 golf courses in Stobo and uh, they are not, yeah. So come golf in Stobo. <laughs> um, and because of our agricultural roots, um, you know, agriculture is still a huge, a huge part of our community. Um, Applewood Farms is, uh, you know, a farm that you can visit. Uh, we've got horse stables, everywhere uh we've got 13 york regional forest tracks within Wichert stoville um the bill fish center is is uh one um up in uh one of our forest tracks 
It is York Region's first net zero uh, facility. It's incredible. Um, there's lots of really cool stuff happening uh, in our town, not to mention it, it depends on the season too. Holiday Market is a three-day Christmas festival that happens at the end of November. Um, Strawberry Festival, which happens Canada Day weekend, you know, draws 50,000 people. Our Rib Fest just a month ago drew over 55,000 people over the weekend. So there's lots of really, really cool stuff that happens in town. Where do you go in town to just decompress after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of meetings, where do you go to just let it all go and recenter yourself to get ready for your next day? Right where I'm sitting right now, my office at home. Most yeah. counselors say that it's their house. I can understand why. Pour myself a scotch and, <laughs> and do some reading. So this is so where it happens right here. I want to end on my last question. It's the most important question, in my opinion. In your opinion, Ian, what makes Stouffville such a unique place to raise a family, to work, and to play? So I think, um, you know, our value proposition, I'll call it, is uh, we are 35 minutes north of the city. You have to drive through farmland to get to us. We have almost all of the amenities you would want in a big city in a small, smallish, but growing town. And, um, and we are not, we are never going to be a large municipal urban center in our municipality. We will, we will continue to celebrate the fact that 95% of our community is protected by the green belt. Um, we will support the Oak Ridges Moraine and all that it entails. And um, we can provide a work-life balance, I think, um, that is unparalleled. You know, we have people that are now coming into Stovall to work and driving north from the city uh, because they don't want to spend three hours sitting in traffic every day. So they're going the opposite way, and we're and we're having lots of really cool investments that are happening on uh, on a business side uh, within town. Really good, good paying jobs in our community, and people are starting to wake up to that. So um, everyone who's moving into Stouffville, it seems, are coming from larger urban centers because they want a more quiet um, lifestyle. And uh, that's something that we're very proud to provide them. Mayor Ian, I want to thank you so much for doing this, taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down to talk about your role as mayor, as council, and also the, uh, the town of Stouffville. It's always appreciative when uh, municipal leaders want to chat about their community. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Chris. Good talking with you. I want to thank our guests for joining us today for a great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And I want to thank you for listening or even watching this episode. Your continued support and interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to what we're doing here on the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is our hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics through our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a pivotal role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page linked in our show notes and on our website at crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can help deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.